Okay. So just a quick note, um, as you know, just turn off cameras and, and, and mics just for the sake of broadband. Um, good evening all, um, if you're based in Greenwich time uh, or nearby. Uh, thank you all for Zooming in for the last Archie Zoom lecture of the season. And there's no better way of ending the season. Uh, so this evening, I am delighted to introduce the great master of cosmic worlds, our Pericopa. Um, I am still in great debt when in, 19, in 2019, um, same time as Perry was the Sir Bannister Fletcher visiting professor at the Bartlett uh, for that academic year. Uh, and he was marvelously kind uh, in accepting to take the train up to Birmingham and enchant us with this over. So still thanking you for, for, for that. Um, so a, a bit of his extensive uh, CV. Um, Perry is an architect uh, and associate professor uh, of architecture at the University of Michigan. He was a sci faculty member for 17 years and held visiting teaching positions at Penn and ASU um, during that time. Following his graduate studies at Columbia University, he worked in the offices of Eisenman, Robertson, Stern and Venturi, Roche uh, and Scott Brown. Um, before mo moving to Los Angeles. His primary interests include the roles and generative potential of architectural drawing, the different spatial opportunities offered by using diverse design methods and design practices, and in broadening the conceptual range by which architecture contributes to our cultural imagination. In 2013, he published pamphlet Architecture 34, Phantoming the Unfathomable, Archival Ghosts and Paradoxical Shadows with friend and collaborator Nat Chart. They are at work on a new book to be published by UCL Press. Um, recently, uh, he optimistically ventured into worlds of digital, attempting to get a hand, handle on cut and paste and magic wand operations in Photoshop. As a result, he has encountered one of his steeper learning curves. Even more recently, he has also been snooping around under the hood of said digital realms. Fantastic beasts have also been on his mind. On a personal note, although I was never one of his many lucky students, Perry has been a great mentor, an omnipresent mentor. Uh, throughout the years, Perry's imaginary words, worlds uh, have pushed me to wander in search of non-metric wonders. Uh, as we look closer into Perry's drawings, we find juxtaposing lines, planes, volumes, typographical elements, photographs, and paper cuts, and cutouts on a plane that aims to uncover the intricate universe of architectural ideas. But it does not stop there. Perry's drawings are fantastic stories, curious fables, and dreams inside dreams. Uh, with this fascinating use of language, he draws worlds with words, each of Perry's architectural drawings is a cosmos of possibilities, a constant visual journey, an architecture of ideas. Above all, Perry is an exceptional person with an individual voice and unique discourse in the world of architecture. And we are so very thankful to have him here on ArchiZoom. So with no further delay, please join me to welcoming Professor Perry Kalpa. Thank you. Thank you very much, B. You must be talking about someone else, or I need to go and find a, my alter ego or something. That's super gracious of you, um, B. Thank you very much, um, and to everyone for coming. Um, thank you, B, for your friendship and your incredible generosity as a parent, a partner, a teacher, a producer, and a cultural agent and protector of the um, our, our wonderful discipline. And thank you for putting the ArcaZoom um, lecture series together. Um, I was only able to catch a couple of them, but I've got that on my to-do list to track those, the ones I didn't hear, see, track those down. So thank you for putting that together. And thanks again to everyone who's turned up. Um, there are a bunch of friends out there who basically just feel sorry for me and they don't want me to feel alone in a Zoom, in Zoom space any longer. So they've turned up, thank you for that. And to um, other kindred spirits and and friends uh, out there, former students uh, and total strangers. Um, so thank you all. Um, I'm going to share a screen with you. 
Um, let me see if we can do this. I got tangled up the other day in Aarhus. Let's see if this works. And there are two PowerPoints. Um, I'm going to share with you uh, the interesting stuff, which is student work. And I'll set that up very, very briefly. Um, I'll show you some work from grad, the graduate representation course, which I both coordinate and teach in here at the University of Michigan. Um, I'll show you a little bit of work from a seminar that I offered a, three years ago to do with um, crossbreeds. And then I'll show you some thesis work. <clears throat> Um, and then I'll, then I'll jump to the less uh, interesting stuff. And that's when everyone will hit the um, in, end meeting button and make a run for the exit when I get to my work. Uh, I'm not gonna read much, but I'm gonna start reading uh, uh, just a bit. Uh, maybe I'll do, yeah. Views of an amateur. Views of an amateur will gain with some key influences, a cross section of work in constructing a teaching practice, tracing processes where an architect might need to be many architects. And I think this is increasingly the case now. The amateur, detective and acupuncturist lurking nearby. Using examples of student work in mind, <clears throat> alongside references to the amateur detective and acupuncturist, and a few key influences, which I'll touch on when I get to my work. This talk and images will build a relational calculus that points to developing spatial representational, cultural and disciplinary participation. The amateur is considered to be the ideal balance of one who thrives on pure intent, maintains an open mind and develops an interest or passion for a subject. Parenthetically, a key definition of the amateur may have its roots in ancient Greek philosophy and the accompanying values that enabled amateur athletes to compete in the Olympic Games. Unlike a contemporary focus on specialization, the ancient Greek citizens would spend most of their time in other pursuits and would compete according to their natural talents and abilities, making the roles of the amateur a viable and even necessary form of cultural construction. Much of the thinking is buoyed by the influences of an amateur. Often my practice is unhinged from forms of expertise and is rather motivated by a willingness to probe relationships amongst things known and discovered in the course of making a body of work. Views or visualizations of an amateur litter the territories I've wondered about occupying and perhaps transforming. In equal part, the detective, in this case, not a member of law enforcement agency, but rather someone who collects evidence to implicate possible crimes, has been a metaphorical authoring position for me for putting parts, fragments, and ideational and visual evidence together, anticipating a plausible and sometimes indeterminate whole. This with an emphasis on world building, producing a cosmology of sorts, one that is uncertain about what the metaphorical crime or crimes might attempt to make sense of. Part of the construction of practices is also linked to thinking about the wild, the wilderness, in part understood as a place for spatial and representational innovation, overcoming that which has been domesticated, normalized, and stripped of a sense of the bewildering establishing a place and a project for harboring the unforeseen, the unknowable, and that which remains at arm's length. Just one more paragraph and then I'll get into the interesting student work. Some persistent things that I think about include a high regard for the history of ideas, for disciplinary ideas, and for cultural structure, working on how to relationally structure things to more effectively tickle the human and maybe non-human imaginations, the use of language, mental, written, visual, as a way to crack things open, design methods and representation techniques, and getting under the metaphorical hood of both to see if there might be some juice or content there on their own terms. The naming problem, increasing my conceptual, formal, and material range, relations between art and architecture, and I don't make necessary distinctions between those to uh, disciplines or other disciplines, and then more fine-grained things that I think about, some persistencies in my work, I would say collections, taxonomies, curiosity cabinets, 
puzzles and games, hybridization, speciation, and genealogy, shape grammars, taxonomies and curiosity cabinets. Sorry, I meant to skip a line. Scaling, unscaling, rescaling, and miniaturization, emergence, incompleteness, and indeterminacy, ambiguity, eccentricity, and unusualness, alchemy, mythologies, alternative temporalities, the generative use of language prompts, narrative possibilities, granularity and resolution, and analogical thinking, to name a few, all targeted at trying to root around varied capacities for architecture. Um, I'll now switch to the student work, uh, which is accomplished here. Let's see if this will do this. Uh, at the University of Michigan, <clears throat> this work is from last year, and I mentioned the graduate representation course, which I generally teach in and coordinate both semesters for the year. And in that course, what we try to do is we try to expose techniques of representation to the students, but we simultaneously try to build uh, their ethics, politics, and a bit about their histories so that the students can more effectively both um, uh, contextualize their work, but also be more dis discretionary about how they deploy a range of representation techniques. I'm gonna show you first just a handful of student pieces of work, excuse me, for a piece of work called Staged Fright, which is a construction site for drawing types. Six week piece of work uh, last year, uh, I essentially asked the students to, we looked carefully at um, uh, orthographic drawing, parallel projection and perspective. Uh, did case studies, precedent work and so on um, to try to understand uh, where they came from, what they did, how authors interfaced with them and so on. Then I asked them to put some clues into a construction site for drawing types for example, a shadow of something that the three drawing types that I mentioned that were sort of held outside of the construction site for drawing types would be brought into the construction site and would begin to work on the clues that they had put into play. So I'm going to show you, they were then, sorry, they were then asked to make an orthographic drawing, parallel projection, and a perspective image of that work. And I'm just going to show you uh, a handful, a cross section of the student work um, hinged to that framing um, of the construction site for drawing types. So the students can also, in the work, I set base parameters for them, but they can also, they can bring any range of things into play that they want to as other kinds of content or things to work with. So they could work with questions of identity or historical bearing of things or sustainability and data sets and so on. Uh, so the work is also in, in addition to trying to build basic understandings of the, the drawing types that I mentioned, the visualization types, uh, the work is also meant to do other things like increase the students formal and material vocabulary. Uh, increase what they think is possible to work on. So a construction site for drawing types is not something that they've turned up with in their portfolio and said, right, we've already done that before. Let's get on to other stuff. So the framing of the work is also meant to stretch them um, so that they can be, they begin to understand that in their own work outside of representation, that they have greater latitude often than they had imagined before they turn up uh, to work with me or the others that teach in the representation uh, group. So these are, these are images of the construction site for drawing types. There's another six week piece of work, um, which is called Crossbreeds, Worlds in Other Worlds. And in this case, also asked the students to make a triptych. They asked them to use downloadable models to build a world that nested other worlds in it. Um, to do two key things. One, to overcome, let's say, schematic or reductive um, articul spatial articulations. And secondly, for them to begin to understand how to use material outside of their own authorship as a way to produce work. They were asked to produce uh, the program uh, was uh, an immediate condition, something like a table 
and then secondly, a threshold, and then thirdly, an outdoor or a, a distant world. So again, the students, the students can, they can set the content for themselves. Um, uh, they take on various kinds of agendas. They get interested in all kinds of things to do with digital working. Uh, we talk about, you know, materialization of these grayscale downloaded models. We talk about materials as real, as coded, and as digitally generated, and so on. So um, again, we're just trying to get trying to get them into uh, thicknesses. Uh, worlds and worlds where they might exceed uh, the kind of conceptual grounds and the design grounds that they've brought uh, brought to the school or brought to this uh, represent to our representation course. Uh, everybody takes the re graduate representation course at the school. It's in the second year of the three-year graduate program, and it's in the uh, first year of the two-year uh, graduate program. Uh, a number of these students I go on and have a good fortune to work in thesis with Adrian here, for example. But I just run through a few more of these um, so you get a sense of the range of work. This is just the, the group of students, about 20, are, are working with me directly. And then there are about four sections. So there are about 80 students uh, each term in the graduate representation course. Uh, shout out to Christy. She just won a... a, a one of the prizes at uh, the K-Rob uh, delineation uh, competition held by in Dallas. So kudos to her. Uh, kudos to everyone. Everybody gets committed to the work. Um, many of them have had no experiences uh, like this. They have no idea. They have to deal with me or it's a sort of peculiar <laughs> is a thing that they have to work out. Um, and so on. So it's it's a great pleasure to be able to work with them. And um, that's some of the representation course. Now I'll switch very, very quickly to the seminar, which I mentioned. And it has to do with uh, crossbreeding. Um, so I asked, there were five pieces of work um, that were nested pieces of work. And they were therefore two to three weeks apiece. We started, everybody started with one of two models of a medieval city. And I asked them to cross that city with some character that I gave them. They drew names out of a hat. So you might cross a medieval city with a casino or a medieval city with a 1957 Chevrolet and so on. So the first piece of work had to do with the, the character and the medieval city. And these are, these are some of the final images uh, from the work of uh, phase one in the seminar. In phase two, I asked them to cross historical types or styles. So for example, someone might get the de Stiel and they'd need to cross that with Art Nouveau, and Art Nouveau or classicism uh, crossed with metabolism. So they were asked again to cross these two historically important genres of work but also then those that piece of work got situated in the medieval city uh, character crossing so these are images uh, just a, a, a cross section not everybody's included uh, but there was equally good work across the board and then i asked them to deal with uh, other morphologies, which had to do with speed and, and change over and through time. So these are all, again, model bits that belong to the same world of the first two setups, um, but trying to work on things which have to do with uh, speeds and change over and through time. And then I'll lastly show you um, one of the other pieces of work uh, what's called it's called material ecstasy and I was asking them to get involved in making a dining table for uh, the spatial setups that they had previously made but by crossing material objectives or material types and remember we talk about materials as real uh, as coded and as um, digitally generated but we also talk about material operating at multiple levels Iconograph as it's the iconography of materials, et 
tin state levels, organizational structure, the technologies that produce them and so on. So that's just a quick sniff of that seminar, which was quite fun. Um, <clears throat> and I think the students enjoy the crossbreeding. I'm gonna offer something a little bit akin to that this next uh, term. Now I'm gonna quickly move through graduate theses uh, over the course of four different years. So at Michigan, we have um, a fall seminar, which is once a week, three hours a week. Uh, and we work with a dozen students. There are about eight to 10 thesis sections. And then we have a winter studio where the students then have a proper studio and time to really work on the work from a, let's say a design perspective. I'm not gonna go over everything here, but in the fall we build up um, a number of grounds um, in terms of where ideas can come from, uh, trying to contextualize their work, their interest, the techniques and methods for working, uh, the, what we call the mechanics of engagement, that is the variables of their work and how they interrelate to one another and so on. The students, I should say the students in the sections that I work with always are, they can, they can work on what they want to work on. I never have a thematic or topical overlay. So I'm gonna switch now to um, thesis work. This was accomplished four years ago in the bluest blue. So all of the thesis units have um, colors attached to their names. Just a fun thing for me and sometimes for them. Uh, Corey was interested in left for dead sites and used uh, Michael Zimmerman and company's environmental philosophy as a way to frame a series of tactics and interventions with respect to these left for dead sites, quarries, landfills, uh, mining sites, and so on. These are some images from the final uh, conversation. I should also say that uh, the students do a tremendous amount of work. Um, they're totally committed to what they're doing. Uh, they spend lots of uh, hours uh, wrangling across and through things. So I'm just showing you both a small percentage of their final images, of the final images, but also uh, the, in the work in total that they do. Yunsen was interested in producing these four prototype cities that dealt with certain urban problems and that developed a whole series of characters and narratives that allowed those problems to be cared for. Yezzy was interested in Paul Virilio's framing of speed uh, and, and dramology and made a series of constructs of which these are details uh, and then eventually worked on a kind of a motel velodrome out in a sort of desert site should also say that the students are invited. We don't take sites for granted. We don't take programs for granted. Some students don't even have programs. So there aren't very many default um, positions taken or allowed actually in the thesis. And this, we try to unpack uh, things like program and site and authoring and so on. So they, they have a greater sense of both liberation, but also the operating protocols uh, within those ordained, uh, commonly shared aspects of architectural education. Sorry, the previous work was about play and pleasure, an old Victorian site north of London. This one's about sort of histories and artificial and reconstructed histories. These are details from a construct, uh, Alcatraz, uh, San Francisco. There are drawings and so forth that Nick made. <clears throat> David, David was interested in what he called being imaginary machines. And he's trying to complement BIM, the kind of reductive capacities of BIM, the ways in which communication happens in practices these days. Anyway, he was reading Proust and made a, a kind of a proposal um, for a character that belongs to Proust and, and so on to work on this problem of being imaginary uh, machine. Simone was interested in third landscapes. Uh, Clement Blanchot's framing of third landscapes, those conditions between, let's say the domesticated landscape and the, the, the wild, and made a kind of fictional, fictional real site that was in the Dakotas, sort of 30 mile long site, and uh, made, a, made a proposition for that site eventually. Uh, John was interested in contemporary possibilities for the production of ornamentation and concocted a site that's made in the section of uh, St. Peter's uh, in Rome and 
the Villa Muller by Adolf Loos uh, at the top of the cathedral and basically developed a kind of production facility for, uh, for producing ornamentation in the section essentially of the uh, St. Uh, St. Peter's Cathedral. Uh, very, very carefully modeled and inscribed with other kinds of information. And th this is actually a demonstration garden and you see the Villa Los in sort of the middle of the screen as part of the work. Taco was interested in systems that beget other systems and he effectively did um, amongst a number of other things. He essentially took a piano apart and reconstructed that um, to look at how systems might not be so particularized or autonomous, but might begin to become a little more ecological or might yield to other um, participations with seemingly closed things, uh, uh, systems. Double purple. Um, Drew was interested in narrative architecture and made a series of physical constructs that then got photographed and he made a series of storyboard like things and then a series of uh, spatial interventions uh, in London of which these are a couple of the images for that work. Uh, Lauren was interested in typology and, and effectively unbuilt typology and, and these are renderings for a house, a new house typology that came out of uh, that very um, intensely focused work on, on typological questions. And then Carl was interested in invasive species um, and worked on a site between uh, Canada and the US uh, and also in the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington DC of which this is an image of a space in which he was involved. Julie was trying to basically compress temporality out of space, was trying to be in three or four places simultaneously. Um, interested in perception, memory, experiential sequences and so on, but how might we be able to be effectively in three or four places simultaneously? And these are renderings that, that, that find part of the final work that explores that set of questions. I'm also being incredibly reductive with respect to what the students are up to. They're much, much, much more complex than I'm characterizing. Um, Chow was interested in kind of new infrastructural systems and species and looked at problems in cities, uh, housing shortages and labor problems and climate change and so on, and basically developed a kind of hypothetical city um, which would be knowable, but then developed a whole series of interventions to look at these new infrastructural uh, conditions in the city. Emily was interested in histories and narrative constructions and basically developed nine characters in a, a kind of real fictional hotel in San Francisco, which has very points to varied time frames and histories and geographies and uh, things which are found and hidden, which aren't expected and so on. It's some of the images of her work. Kyle was interested in the, the questions of rendering and, and talk, started talking about scratches and smudges on renderings and wondered if he could rethink uh, rendering techniques um, to find latent uh, potential in both the way the machine and software op operates, but also in terms of how renderings operate. And these are some of the images and then a physical construct from Kyle's work. He's, he's actually working with me now on something that I'll finish with in my work. I'm very, very grateful to him. And I'm super, super, super grateful to be able to work with all of these incredibly talented students, totally committed to what they're doing and so on, both at SARC, but also here at Michigan more recently. Um, Luna was interested in lost histories in Beijing and essentially rebooted Beijing, uh, trying to recover and point to a number of lost histories from smells on streets to bicycle uh, bells ringing across the night in the city. So it's a whole reconstruction of, of, of Beijing. Uh, Kaiser was interested in identity, social conditions, gender issues, and basically made a kind of a, a public, public restroom as it were, located on the mall in Washington DC. And these are some of the final images Ben was interested in questions of rendering, 
and used to kind of common in narrative constructions and used a kind of common, he set up um, a sort of an office uh, world and housing and then made these, these renderings to try to think about activities and experiences in these, these environments, the housing and office environment through new ways of, of rendering. Longhuan was interested in memory constructions and perception and how deep memory and active memory and imagination and latent constructions to do with memory actually work. Uh, she, she worked on three casinos and I'm showing you images from one of the casinos uh, in terms of her work. And then Shirley was interested in The Third Man, the film The Third Man, Man and narrative constructions and basically rebuilt sort of hidden parts of Vienna in Austria linked to criminals and detectives um, with respect to the film and her interest in narrative construction. And these are renderings of, of interventions of both an above ground, but also below ground Venice, uh, 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 Vienna, not Venice. And then last year, another really great group of students to work with. Um, Kuhn was interested in what he called behind the scenes. And in similar to Kyle was interested in what happens behind the perfect rendering or outside or through the perfect rendering. And while I always get the descriptions wrong for the students because they're far too complex and I, I see them differently than, they're do, than they do, uh, he basically was interested in trying to produce a perfect scene of which these are digital renderings to deal with problems of things that, that lie outside of the perfect scene, the backstory as it were, and trying to allow those to become part of new perfect scenes. Amlin was interested in Robert Venturi uh, complexity and contradiction and I had the good fortune to work with Denise and Bob for five years before I moved to LA so I had a great interest in in in, in both Amlin and her work but also in in uh, in complexity and contradiction was a real influence for me anyway she worked on a site in Rome in which she used Disney characters and remnants and new parts of architectures to work through questions that Venturi framed in complexity and contradiction. And then John, who's on the call, um, and thanks to other students who have turned up, former students and friends who have turned up, uh, John made what he called the 500 mile armature and he fundamentally was asking about questions, uh, questions about things that architecture and architects haven't and can't do. He had things like spherical rejection arrays and propaganda release valves and so on in this proposition for a real site in Iowa in the middle of the United States. These are nocturnal renderings of John's work. Jan Howe was interested in the Silk Road and um, uh, the histories of the Silk Road, both deep and present histories, and, and essentially developed a kind of mm, motel, Silk Road motel, and a series of gardens to ruminate on uh, trade and travel and how you get 6,000 miles to be talked about in a mile and a half or however long the proposal was. These are rooms that belong to that motel. And, various architectural and landscape architectural elements. And Sydney was interested in triangulating, she was interested in mythologies, contemporary understandings of construction and mythologies in America, work between Beijing and Rome and the big box in uh, the Walt Disney Studios in 1942 and presently in uh, Burbank, California. And these are images from, from, Sydney's, uh, from Sydney's super interesting work. Annabelle was interested in contestation, found a series small group of islands uh, that both Japan and China claim ownership to and made a proposition based on certain rituals and historical, historically important uh, customs in both Japan and China to, to talk about contestation and ownership and territorialization and so on, essentially rebuilt the island. 
Uh, Michael was one of the islands. Michael was interested in questions of representation and perspective in particular, looked at, was looking at Dutch things and Italian things and histories of representation and used a series of windmills to explore, uh, try to open up questions about perspective and framed a book. Uh, and I, I'm a, I know he will carry out that book. So watch out, watch out for that one. Uh, these are images from, from some of his work uh, in, in the studio. Chris was interested in uh, histories and augmenting technologies and narrative constructions and worked on a real site in Indiana, a, a quarry, and developed a series of machine instrument device-like things which talk about lost histories and generative potentials and history and technologies and so on. John came, was really interested in how he worked, how he made decisions, where, where uh, content could come from. And he basically worked on a kind of fictional landscape, suburban site with a kind of a house in it eventually. And these are images of the house, um, house-ish. We use a lot of ishes in both the seminar and the studio, but also in representation because we're not so certain about naming. We want to get around things, but not lock them down. So ish is, is common. As Sean was interested in dissident architects and how he might think about others being able to practice architecture in ways that weren't ordained or um, sustained through both the academic world, but also the professional world and basically developed a spatial environment and a series of tactics in which dissonancy could be foregrounded. And then lastly, in the student work, Iran, Iran was interested in hybridization, sort of cross-pollinating cultural traits and spaces and different places through forms of digitization. And these are hybrid, these are hybrid objects that got produced as a re result of the cross-pollinization of these various cultural traits, phenomena, and spatial setups. So that's it for the um, student work. I'm going to try to escape that. And then I'm going to just, if you'll be just patient with me a titch, I will um, open PowerPoint with my far less interesting work and I'll scoot through that. Okay, it's just opening. I'll be with you in just a second if the gods of Zoomscape and PowerPoint are along for the ride here. Again, so there's not the blank radio airtime here. I just wanted to extend a huge thanks to everyone for turning up and again to be uh, her great work and influences and teaching and and so on. It's just really, really grateful. It's humbling actually to be in the midst here. Uh, don't know why I asked, get asked to do things like this, but um, I try to, I don't know, fake my way through it. Yeah, I'm almost there. And then I'll move quickly so we're not here until Friday. There we go. I updated my operating system to Catalina about mm, six weeks ago and I've had nothing but tangles. So anyone who's out there and is needing to update the OS for a Mac, I'd be, I'd be a little bit careful about Catalina. Apparently there are lots of tangles. All right, I think I'm where I need to get. So I'm gonna share this with you. And I'm gonna forego a little bit of what I was gonna say just for the sake of time. Um, let's see. See, I want to get rid of that. I just want to go there. All right. We're still in the views of an amateur realm, and that's me, I'm for absolutely sure. Um, I always say, I, I, I keep, I'm a list, I, I make lists and I keep track of things that are important to me. And for me, this is the most important uh, 15 or 16 things that belong to my own work. Um, and I'm not, I won't go through them in any kind of detail at all, but relational thinking and relational structuring is effectively all I do, both in teaching and my own work. And B in her gracious introduction, you know, mentioned 
you know, drawings and design methods and enlarged conceptual breadth, those are important to me. The naming problem is super important to me. That is, when we name things, we normally, we've already finished the piece of work. A bedroom results in a bed near the bathroom with, you know, Eastern light coming in and, you know, about 12 feet by 15 feet, depending on your economic or social status. But if rather I ask you to work on problems of defecation, dreaming, privatization of sexuality, and so on, which also constitutes something like a bedroom, you might not, you might not end up with that same room that I characterized. Um, yeah, I'll just let your eyes go over these. We don't uh, have time to um, move through them. I would say I owe a lot to Wallace Stevens, 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. Uh, I use 13 ways. It's a poem which I like very much where he implicates blackbirds indirectly in the 13 stanzas, but never speaks directly about a blackbird. But it's been very, very useful as a sort of metaphorical and analogical author for me in terms of framing all kinds of things. Uh, I keep track of people and objects, phenomena, things, conceptual frameworks that are important to me. This is a recent thing that I've been ruminating on. It's trying to be a little bit comprehensive about things which comprise practice and education for me, for the grounding in the history of ideas, to curricular models, to lineage, key lineages and thinkers, to ethics and moralities and values of a school, uh, and so on. So this is something I'd like to try to chase uh, soon. Uh, in, in more depth, but it's, it's around me all the time in teaching and talking, working patterns and work. I mentioned some of those things before and you'll see some, I don't need to, I'm super repetitive while I try to be incredibly diverse and plastic and versatile. Every piece of work I do is identical. So uh, do as I say, not as I do. Anyway, I keep track of the work that drawings can do as a way to rehearse design decisions, to think visually, as a way to open default assumptions and so on. The table behind me looks like that. When I get ready to work, sort of clean the work area up, get gear out, this is what it looks like two weeks ago. This is what a, the other workspace where I'm talking to you from right now looks like. Uh, be alluded to my interest in, yeah, a little bit. I don't know anything about the digital world realm, so I just a couple of Photoshop things. I'm going to show you the work according to fast, slow, and medium paced work. So these are projects for me. They're very, very fast. There are about 65 of them. They're called conceptual catalysts. They're organized according to seven contemporary categories. For me, they're contemporary categories, materiality, fabrication, production, atmospheres, change and flux, and so on. And they, they are things like digital mania project. Um, architecture is a fast change artist project. Pixelated architecture project. Architecture that forgets its own presence project architecture of fast and slow surfaces and so on. When is the time of rendering? So this is fast work, keeps my imagination alive, keeps my conceptual framework alive and well. And some of these things, a handful of them I'd actually like to work on. Then I do other kinds of fast work. In 1990, when I moved to LA, I was asked to participate in a competition, which was a five week competition. I worked on five proposals in the five weeks. This one was made in 10 days, so it's very, very fast for a house based on a 600-year-old text. At roughly the same time, I started to make landscape drawings. They were made one a day um, on 18 by 24 inch double white trace, uh, 45 minutes to an hour and three quarters, two hours top end, uh, 750 of them ask no questions, just work, don't throw them away, don't make heavy judgments about them, trying to develop understanding about landscape, about materials, uh, about representational questions and so on. I always say that if people out there have an appetite doing one a day things, absolutely great, 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 great. I haven't done these in 16 years now, but I, again, I've got two of them the two sets that I'd like to do in my pocket. My friend Jim Barton asked me to make a cover for 
her new online journal, a super fast drawing. Uh, Ava asked me to make a drawing for auction storefront to raise money, super fast drawing. Working on a kind of a project with Nat Shard, my good friend that we didn't, I didn't quite get to and we, we sort of tabled it, it's called Below the Horizon, just an autopsy, part of an autopsy for the images of the Titanic. Good friend Gretchen Wilkins invited me and I think 29 others around the world to make two pages in a book linked to documenting urbanism. And these are my two pages enlarged to do with alchemic urbanism using uh, word language folds like soft orange metro blooms waiting, milled surplus data, overcoated erased gold leafed residuals and so on to try to think about urbanism piece of work that's underway right now, trying to get rid of the horizon, let's say, and I'm trying to work on a ground or floor triptych and a ceiling. These are just cut paper pieces for that piece of work. Erased Vermeer is very fast, trying to look at the great Dutch painter, Johannes Vermeer's art of painting and by erasing it, uh, as I move to the right, trying to find an art of architecture through erasure. Erasure is something that's interested me uh, and a handful of pieces of work take up erasure as both a representational but also a spatial technique, let's say. Vertical surfaces are worked quickly, so these all the entire image is imagined as a surface of an architecture, an envelope, let's say. Just a quick image of what the work table looks like in the production of the second of six uh, vertical surfaces related to imaging techniques, me medical imaging techniques as a sort of drive. The first one was related to just appropriating my own work. Uh, the Photoshop realm, I am more Neo than any Neo fight in the world with uh, Photoshop. Uh, but I decided two years ago to try to open it up and see if I could work out how to download images and then make a couple of modifications to them. And I decided that I would give myself a framework, a kind of programmatic framework of a of speculative house, garden, and landscapes. Um, and so I, I basically appropriate images, uh, some of mine's an image that I find of a, an interesting time-lapse photograph from, you know, an insect. And I try to then build in these sort of drone or plan-like views I try to imagine, not directly, probably more analogously, houses, gardens, and landscapes through these through this work. Um, normally made, B is up much later, I know this, than I am. Uh, but these are normally made sort of midnight. They're an hour, hour and a half, two hours a piece. And I made about 150 of them, and I'm just showing you a cross section of some of those uh, house, garden, and landscape proposals here. Uh, I don't throw any away. I don't make heavy judgments about them. I work a bit improvisationally. Sometimes I have an idea or two. Sometimes the ideas are discovered as I work, which interests me a lot. I'd rather discover my interests rather than know them and try to prove them. So these are just, again, they're very, very quick. You can see I've got no idea. <laughs> I can't even use the, uh, the magic wand properly, to be honest. So, but I know the transform tool just a little bit. Magic wand I can use. I can fiddle around with layers and brightness and so on, but that's about the extent of it. So this is just, again, one of my, two of my drawings actually. Uh, being used to produce this house garden landscape uh, sort of proposal. So again, they're, they're, they, they weren't run one a days, but they're in some ways a digital parallel to the landscapes that I made uh, between sort of 92 and 2004, the 750 drawings. I would say out of the 150 of these, I like, it's, it's okay, I don't mind saying I like once in a while, or a lot, I like probably a dozen of them and I could imagine sort of taking them uh, to the next level. And I'm gonna show you a few images in a minute where uh, my good friend, Jeff Halstead, who used to teach her at the school and is doing an MFA at Columbia now, super talented 
character, very smart, uh, lovely uh, character and friend. He he saw some of these and said, "Let's let's uh, do a quick collaboration and see what 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 something might look like um, uh, three dimensionally." Let's say. So this is the work with Jeff. I'll just show you a few images. So this is an image that I made with a bit of help from Simon, who, who also helped me with one of the bird motels. And then this is a quick uh, collaborative effort trying to visualize what what this house garden landscape might be. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a at least formal terms. I don't know about I don't know about physical or certainly not material terms yet. But this is a first translational pass. Um, this is me, and then this is uh, what came out of that. So basically, Z brush work. I've done some. Also some quick work, Photoshop, where I was interested in what I call proto-objects, proto-architectures, you know, just finding things again and working with them. But in these, I got, I got more interested in my clumsiness with Photoshop, how I blank things out with a paintbrush, for example, or how I, how I, how I try to sort something out. So I got interested in all of these things much more than, than the figures themselves in this work. There are a couple of these that I could imagine trying to develop. I don't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to just re-describe what these look like, but these, these are probably analogic, analogic images. Again, fun to make probably, these are probably more in the realm of two and a half or three hours because I'm just not very fast at Photoshop. Working on a project that I call 2080, where I'm trying to get 80% of the juice of a piece of work in 20% of the effort because most of the time I've got a lot of stuff running around in my work, um, whether it's interesting or relevant or important to anybody else, that's another story, but I tend to gut work. So I'm trying to empty it a little bit with this piece of work, which is current. This, is, this was on the drawing table mm, two weeks ago. And that's our wonderful daughter, Ella, who's the most important part of that uh, table. Also working on a what I call Google Earth Deep Horizon and uh, Capper, who's on the call here, we might he might tickle a little bit of this with me, but I'm interested in how Google Earth is a form of uh, cultural communication now, and it comes out of some of Mark friend Mark Nor Dorian's writings on Seen from Above, that wonderful book of his. But I'm interested in how we might reconcile Google Earth with, say, again, perspective, horizon, the station point, and so on. So I'm thinking about a series of arcs in the Midwest that deal with our agricultural iconography, uh, language drifts, uh, this problem of Google Earth to deep horizon, animal husbandry, and so on. So, so, so super, super early days for that. Slow work. David's Island, 1996. Um, I started to pry the ar architectural drawing open because I was quite conventional in terms of how I worked on work. Um, so I used the competition to open the architectural drawing, to think through a series of, of ideas and imagine programmatic possibilities for sustaining those ideas and to keep a bunch of different kinds of ideas in place simultaneously. So most of these drawings are 24 by 36. There's about six layers, animal x-rays and cut paper and drawn parts and parts of film envelopes and so on. Um, but it was a super important piece of work for me, the content we won't go into now, but lots of ideas about uh, islands and panoptic and panoramic vision and maritime mythologies and so on. And then programmatic things like camouflagic surfaces and landings for mythical sea travelers and flooded building landscape structures and an axis of mutiny and so on. And then a technical drawing of the architectural elements for that work. And then I continued my interest in the architectural drawing in 2001 in a competition that I didn't enter, didn't submit for a museum in Fresno, California. And I, I developed a series of for me, they're, maybe everybody does them, but for me, I name them, not to, notwithstanding my naming problem problem. Uh, but this is a thematic drawing for the museum, which essentially is the key ideas or interests that I had going into the work. Uh, then there are a series of cryptic drawings, which are plan-like, 
but they're a bit like the DNA uh, for the museum. They're indexical, crossed with sort of notational things to remind me about certain topical interests, about certain geometric and material predilections and so on, but they're not that, they're not that yet. This is also a kind of genetic drawing that's a proto-formal for one of the pieces in the museum, a muse archive. And then I, I enjoy making drawings that have, this is a kind of composite drawings or a proto-formal section where there are some things that are geometrically accurate, use of language, occasional programs, daedalus, dioramic clouds, breeding complete or indeterminate familiarity. So I use language. There are pieces of drawings that get left in drawings that have become provocative to me. I'm super interested in the construction lines and so on. I'm, I'm interested in the latent energy of drawings as much as the explicit description. And then we made a Sin Luz in Beijing now with his own a wonderful little practice. It made a quick rhino model of uh, uh, the first the first take on the on the museum itself. And then my very good friend, colleague Nat Chard, and I were fortunate enough uh, to win in 2012 Pamphlet Architecture 34. Uh, and we worked with another good friend, Mark Stanley, uh, teaches at Tennessee, Knoxville, uh, on a book. Mark helped us with the book, and I made a series of drawings linked to Nat and my interest in indeterminacy and contingent architecture. And these are some of the drawings. I made I think six drawings for this, this specific piece of work that's in pamphlet architecture. And then we made a couple of drawing instruments based on uh, a whole lineage of Nat's incredible drawing instruments and his interest in the, the picture plane and indeterminate interests and so on. Um, but we, as a way to develop our friendship because we didn't know each other well at the time, but we were, hundreds of miles and now thousands of miles apart, these drawing instruments were made to essentially stage a conversation to do with indeterminacy, our friendship, you know, ways to work on things collaboratively and so on. And these are photographs that Nat made of the, uh, the drawing instruments at war, uh, friendly war. Um, and then we've been very, very lucky and I'm grateful to ride Nat's coattails to have a couple of exhibitions. Uh, this one in Winnipeg about four years ago when we offered a week long workshop there and then be alluded to the one um, when I was the visiting, Bannister Fletcher visiting professor at the Bartlett a couple of years ago, Nat and I were also fortunate enough to have an exhibition at the school. So this is the Winnipeg realm mostly to show you some of Nat's drawing instruments and some of the drawings and images that he's produced. Extraordinary work, uh, which is, uh, yeah, Instagram. If you don't know Nat, get on his Instagram feed and on his blog. Medium speed work, which I'll finish with. Uh, two houses. Um, when I moved to LA, I had uh, three houses, um, a small guest house, uh, it's 1990 a real house in one of Southern California's deserts. None of these got built. And they, I call them now sacrificial projects because they allowed me to reflect on, on my own uh, lack of skill sets. I think uh, I didn't know Terry, Sergeant who's on the call, I think. I didn't know Terry quite now, but he probably got an earful of this kind of stuff. My lack of skills, my inability to design stuff when Terry was at both ASU and SIRC where I was teaching. And uh, anyway, these houses didn't get built, but they were, they were to me as well as I could do at the time. Um, there were clients, uh, they were related to the context and experience and so on. They, they were okay, but were really, really limited. At the same time, Amy was starting uh, a PhD at Cambridge in England. We lived in a small house when I was there. Uh, a couple of six week chunks of time each year. Um, so I, I, I made a proposal for, for, that, for, for, that, for that house. It's basically a room with a double aquarium, a leather floor, a steel wall, and so on that deal with you know, heaven and hell and cemeteries and blue collar working and so on. 
the graphite drawing Desert House got opened up a little bit through what I called aspectival drawings, where I was trying to find a way to escape the, the grip of the station point, the picture plane. And so I was making drawings for the second version of that house that I called aspectival drawings, which are basically critical fragments for the house. They're not elevations or plans. They're nothing like that. They're just critical aspects of the house. And then erasure continued in a what I call the bleached out house project. Here I'm not working on the house, but I'm just working on erasure. Again, layer drawings, 30, 24 by 36. These are about 50 to 55 hour drawings, a whole series of uh, interventions in them. And then to counter my slow working, I developed the fast twitch house in 2003. And I made site drawings for three of the houses. And this is one that got developed a little bit. So I was trying to work analogically. That is through likeness, uh, likenesses. So there are things like empty game boards, things like petticoats, things like cloaked figures, and so on in this house um, proposal. There are landscape milling machines, which mill garden surfaces in a much larger geography. Uh, there are chrome shadows, chrome billiard balls, labyrinth, pink dust garden, and so on to work on this fast twitch, uh, working quickly. Sleeping chambers, stairs to nowhere, cast biplane, and so on. Quick, this would take a tremendous amount of work to get this into a proper place. But again, Sin was helping model things quickly. And uh, Johnny and Mark, Syrac students, about six weeks after Ella was born, 15 years ago, I was invited to the Prague Biennale and asked to deal with transient architecture and made what we called the Metaspheric Zoo a strategic plot essentially which the david's island drawing is sort of a version of this is this is a sort of a strategic plot and thematic drawing for a metaspheric zoo which is a cross between metaphor and atmospheres and is the proposal is based on animal behaviors uh species interrelations breeding techniques migratory patterns and so on but that work didn't get other than the strategic plot it didn't get down the road we used to have a great program here called Research Through uh, Making at the University of Michigan. And in the first year, 12 years ago, I was able to, I got one of the first uh, year grants and worked on what I call spatial blooms with a former student called Justin. Great, uh, everybody, all the former students, people work with me, great, 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 great. Um, we worked on sort of trying to breed landscape elements, landscape types, and landscape biologies to rethink architecture in, in alternative temporal terms. And there are fabric predators and test tube berms and zipper blooms and so on in this indexical, real, and notational sort of spatial proposal. Again, this is probably 8 to 10% where it should have gotten. I gave back four fifths of my money because I didn't, couldn't get organized to use it all. So that's a Perry problem. And then my dear friend Coy Howard and I, in the just after Syrac moved downtown in 2001, two and three, were working on a series of um, speculative rooftop houses. And this summer, I finally got around to these aren't quite finished in these images, but I got around to uh making making the plans uh of these houses they're really really different they have different objectives and interests mostly at that time we we're just trying to work on a friendship and trying to work out you know eh, some shared interests but also things that were anathema to both of us so those are big plans for those houses and then i'm getting near the end here if you hang with me thank you for sticking with it uh, former three former thesis students omar sam and mark uh, got invited to make a birdhouse and basically jettisoned <laughs> the iconic birdhouse and, and decided to do something a little bit different. And we, we made some inspirational drawings and then made a physical uh, construct. Um, that's our bird motel that deals with human 
non-human relationships and tries to advance the cause of the birds more than the cause of human beings. And there are a number of key pieces like this taxonomic spiritual bird, uh, there was a windsock room and all artificial clouds and hedges and landing strip and bird perches and so on. Uh, my good friend Mark West, whose work you should also know much more than mine, all these people more than me. Uh, Mark's a good friend who was also interested in trying to do a sort of collaboration and, because I told him that that bird motel was essentially seen as an ecology over and through time. So that's what the you know, series of drawings that uh, look at how that would, how the morphology of that bird motel would, would develop. And then Simon uh, was in the bluest blue. Um, the third landscape guy helped on a second bird motel in which we basically poached on the first parts of the first model, uh, the bird motel, and then made a second bird motel, which is called El Dorado. It has a stuffed technology garden. Uh, it has a talisman, which is a key place where the birds eat. It has dancing topiary bird alphabet hedges. Uh, it has a bird ballroom and with dioramic wallpaper. It's got a sail that's an homage to Wallace Stevens. This is the stuff technology garden. So these are just, these are images. Um, there are many prototypes um, of the bird motel. There are paired ones, there are single ones, there are birds and a half, different materialized differently. They behave in fictional and real spaces. They travel singly and in groups. Excuse me. Just some of the final images that we made. And then Carl, also a former thesis student. All these characters are good friends and worked on a third bird motel. Similar interests in the human non-human realm and travel and aerial constructions and so on. Um, it's got lots of things in it's housing and an artificial weather garden, a zoetropic restaurant, a talisman that cares for the bird's well-being. It 3D prints Wallace Stevens poems. It's got a working log. Uh, it's got a theater and there's a shrine and spa inside this piece. Homage to Loger's primitive hut part of the diving board realm. There are multiple versions of that one as well. Still interested in the air. Nat and I took a trip to Orford Ness in the UK and we thinking about doing a project there and I made for that project just initially made three analogical drawings for what I called aerial diptych follies. The top is for pleasure and spectacularness in the sky and the bottom the bottom parts have to do with surveillance. And that's what one of the drawings looked like. Uh, Simone again helped a bit Photoshop on these. They're cut paper and me scanning things and printing them and cutting them out and taping them and, and all of that. And then a, a good friend and another former student, Oliver Popovich, we got interested in, got a little bit of seed money for relationships between image and mo digital modeling. So we took the three aerial diptych follies, the drawings which I made, and in Blender, those got modeled. And then each one of the three has a particular sort of programmatic objective. Like this one's meant to generate a sort of move to, towards a kind of theatrical staged filmic like realm. So we're also, we're just asking questions about relationships between imaging and modeling. And again, I've said this you know, before, people have heard me interested in file sizes and wireframes in relationship to rendering and can you model notations and do images have backsides and all kinds of questions in, in which we can interrogate those uh, apparently flat images, but we're trying to uh, see if there's something else on offer. And this is the workspace that we're also interested in. Blender, everything, all the, the command panels, the cropping uh, screenshots and so on, all those things are of interest in this work. Um, everything's modeled and worked very, very carefully on 
tape is modeled and <laughs> um, all this stuff. If uh, we've got a few people out there who I've talked with about a think tank in, in the audience, if they're still, if they haven't hit the exit uh, button, but this is stuff that I would enjoy working on in a think tank, the business, be, the relationship between image and imaging and modeling. And yeah, this is, this is, this is the realm that we really, really care about. Those dashed lines, the spherical lines, the, the background gray space, all this, all those things we were interested in in this work. So I'm just showing you some quick digital models, renderings, not quick digital models, these things are quick. And it's take a little bit of time to, uh, to build in that realm. I'm almost finished. If you can hang with it for one more piece of work. Yeah, these, these interest me. This work interests me. Not much of my work does, to be honest, uh, but that, that work interests me still. Um, so Kyle uh, and I are working on triptychs, domes, and still lifes. It's, it's work that is interested in how we use historical precedents generatively. So in the work we're looking at Borromini and shrines at Issei and Mies and Noli maps and lost, lost civilizations and Chinese scroll painting and so on. And there are three strategies which we're exploring. This is the first one, which is called niche. And these are older shots of the digital model, uh, some of the renderings, uh, which tries to stage those historical precedents to see if we can understand them and work with them generatively. So this is Borromini, for example, the uh, San Carlo, the dome being flattened and then redrawn and drawn out by angels and getting involved in triptychs and Issei and devices and so on. So that's that's just a part of part of the work. And this is one of the final, this is this is the final setup right now. And we're just working on some sort of lighting images and unusual views at the moment. Then there's a second version which takes the same elements effectively and just organizes them. It's called knowing. And some of these are a little bit a little bit earlier images, but you get a feel for the work where we're trying to uh, we're translating, of course, some of the earlier precedents, but we're also trying to just use organizational structure, not trying to produce narratives or uh, sub stories. We're just trying to use organization as a way to work on the work. So, you know, there are things like Turkish moths that are referred to in the proje shadow projections of them and tagging logics in this in this realm of uh, the knowing realm. And there's the Borromini table, the San Carlo here, the church plan here, and then uh, sort of an homage to Borromini himself uh, in this realm animals and tagging systems and other things come into play here as well to help draw out some of the capacity of this organizational uh, realm. And this is one of the final renderings. This is what uh, this, the, the model setup uh, is this at the moment. And then one last quick one. Uh, we're working on what we call Riyawanji comma reconstruction. So the great Zen garden of Riyawanji in Kyoto, Japan. Uh, we're taking some of the same elements that we've been working on in the first two strategies, but we're now trying to develop hybrid elements which take a number of Japanese characteristics, practices, aesthetic values, and we're trying to produce sort of hybrid objects that re help reconstruct the 15 rock outcroppings uh, that exist in the garden itself. And these are preliminary uh, these are some of the preliminary images, and I'll show you a couple of more final images. This is what the garden looks like modeled you know, as a sort of a fact. The sky is modeled, and th 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 this is what it is look like. This is the space. This is the, this is the model. This is the, the, the garden setup, and this interests me. The discontinuous field, the critical fragments, the white space, all kinds of things in this are real interesting to me. Worked recently on some erasure, cloaking, veiling things. Uh, we're trying to get representational energy into some of the images now. So using selective fragments and working on them through Photoshop is a critical tool to rethink the garden actually, not to represent it. 
So they're just a handful of images to finish here. Um, linked to, in this case, nocturnal thinking, wireframes, rendering, laser lights, drawing certain capacities of the digital model and the, the spatial setup out. And then just a couple of the images that are literally the last image I'll, feel, uh, I'll finish with, uh, literally uh, in this morning. So we're working, on, we're working on a series of images right now, which is the last one that I'll share with you, um, linked to the, no, this nocturnal realm um, of the Rio Anji uh, so spatial setup. So sorry, that took forever, my apologies, but that's all I got. So thank you again to B, to the school, to ArcaZoom and to everybody. If there's anyone still out there, it's hard to know. I can see that four of you are still there. Fabio's still there. Thank you, my friend. Um, uh, but that's, 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 that's uh, it for me. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Perry. Wonderful, wonderfully inspiring. Um, I'm just thinking of my students that have their final review tomorrow uh, and wanted them to have work like this pinned up, uh, even though we, we can't have a real pinned up tomorrow, we, it has to be virtual. Um, thank you so much for all the inspiration. I'm going to open the Q&A now, you know, some questions for Perry. You just open the chat. B, B again, thank you for everything. Um, but do you want me to do you want me to stop sharing the screen, B? It's up to you. Um, yeah, want to look at me it's or good to look see you. Screen? Yeah, it's good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, we've had enough of my work. We can go back to the student work if we need to. That's plenty for me. I've had it. So we have a note from Philip that says, Thank you, Perry, for sharing amazing work. A uh, pleasure. Oh, they're coming so fast. Um, do we have some questions? I do. Uh, may I go first, please? Hi, Emery. <laughs> hi. Uh, hi, Perry. Um, uh, hi, Emery. I'm, I'm Emery, and um, I do follow your work uh, everywhere constantly. I love it. Um, if you are prolific at what you do, you do produce a lot of work, and um, it is very inspiring inspiring to see for sure, especially those drawings that you've done one a day 16 years ago. Um, those, those are some of my favorites because I think the key to, you know, producing great work is doing it constantly, you know, producing, producing and producing. There's no other way but to do. Mm. Um, so my question is, all this work you've got, um, both digital and traditional, where do you store them? How do you store them? <laughs> this is this is gonna. This is a hard, really, really hard question, Emery. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so I basically store them in about four boxes. Three of those boxes are under the bed, and one of them's under a table in the living space. That's that's amazing. <laughs> they're, 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 they're 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 yeah. They they just they, they sit in boxes. I never, except when I am fortunate and I'm super grateful and humble to have exhibitions. I never ever ever look at the drawings. <laughs> so yeah, they're, I, yeah they're, they're just in boxes. Yeah, um, and my other question is: um, Do you sometimes feel limited by the tools that you have at at your disposal, like Photoshop, yeah, like pencils, yeah, sure. like scissors? Oh, for sure. I feel like. Not, not that not that I think my work is good. I, I, I say this often. I think the work is is average. I think there's some a few decent pieces in there. Uh, I don't know that I could make it better with digital skills and virtual skills, but I would give uh, I'd literally give my right arm and learn to draw with my left one if I had digital skills. I, I simply can't work on. There's no way. When I think about, for example, an architecture that occupies two or three centuries that are hundreds of years apart that morphologically shifts between a narrative object and an indexical figure, which I think about these things all the time. I don't know how to draw that realm out, but good friends always, 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 they say the techniques are not where, that's not where you're going to make the money. Just get on with it, man. Quit complaining about not having any skills. But yes, I would. Uh, yeah, I feel totally hamstrung. Thank you so much. You're this very welcome. Great. Thanks for the question. Yep. Yeah, 
I see your lips moving, Fabio, but can't hear you. You're like a ventriloquist. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, almost. Almost? Yeah, pretty clear. Hey, thank you, thank you very much. Very, uh, I couldn't avoid to make some, just a couple of questions. Thank you so much for this incredible uh, uh, lecture. And um, I took a series of notes here. I mean, it's so much to say, and there's so much to, to think about. It's a, it's a fantastic lecture. It's really challenging, as you, I'm sure you know this. So there is such an amount of uh, different uh, path, paths to follow. And uh, uh, I, I just wrote a series of notes. Uh, so I just uh, present a short series of uh, thoughts that I had uh, together with the notes that I took from your speech. Uh, the first one was a, super, su a supernova explosion. That was the, the impression that I had from your presentation. <laughs> So I, I'm going to take notes now, Fabio. I'm going to take notes. <laughs> I, I was. Um, I, I often think about. Um, well, I, I have a great uh, interest and passion uh, about music. And the first time that I, I saw an exhibition of your works, uh, actually, it was the, the only time I saw that. It was in London a long time ago. And uh, I, I tell you, I give a, a sort of parallelism with music. Uh, uh, that was the the the, the, the explosion. The explosive time of the IT um, uh, revolution, and I saw your drawings about the island, and uh, and I, I thought about your work uh, in that moment. Uh, that like if uh, uh, I mean in 1976 uh, was born the punk music, uh, and in the in the in the same year were born was born a completely different kind of music, which was from Dire Straits, an incredibly talented. Uh, uh, yeah. musician Mark Knopfler with his yeah. incredibly uh, delightful and beautiful uh, um, compositions completely in the opposite direction rather than what was the main part which was punk music uh, with all the aggressive and uh, violent sound and so on so I, I, I often think about your research uh, about drawing uh, hand drawing uh, because in that when, when I saw that ex exhibition uh, uh, in that occasion, there were your hand drawings, uh, your, your six layers drawings. So this forced me to start to, to try to understand where you were going, uh, literally. It was just my, many years later that we entered in contact uh, and uh, we started to chat every now and then. Yeah. So I, I was thinking about uh, this uh, um, uh, need in going forward uh, about hand drawing uh, reminded me of uh, an artist, uh, uh, Piet Mondrian. He, yeah. he, he went through the, uh, a straight direction uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of research towards the edges of the art in that moment. And sure. in, the, in, the, in the meantime, during all his life, he painted beautiful flowers. So what I'm asking here, one of the things that I, I mean, it's just a curiosity, uh, Together with this impressive and beautiful amount of work, you reminded me uh, about a quote that I always tell to my students, uh, is, is a quote from the Nike advertising, just do it. So it is like if you, you just do it, you go on, you go on, you go on. And uh, I'm just curious to know, do you ever go back in drawing uh, just simply uh, for the pure pleasure of hand drawing, like city landscapes of flowers, in the case of uh, Pete Mondrian, so the 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 natural, let's say, uh, it's like putting back uh, your feet on the ground every now and then, because your research is so on the edge that I'm I'm I'm, I'm impressed about the your ability in going in standing on the edge. So I'm curious about this. Uh, this if you, if you ever feel this need of balance between something uh, uh, more formal, uh, both from uh, a pa 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 um, painting point of view or drawing point of view, or architectural point of view as well. So you, you presented some houses, but they, they are dated back from several years ago. So that's, uh, I don't know if I'm clear, if it is clear what I'm, I'm saying. I'm not entirely sure. I like the points that you're making. I'm taking and registering those in my, in my head. 
Abby, I'm not sure exactly what the question, or, I'm sorry. Just, just the end part, I followed you until the, to the question really. Well, no, it's just, I'm just curious to know if, if you have, it's just a curiosity, do you have also a sort of sketchbook in which you every now and then just draw um, formal drawings, formal views, uh, the landscapes or flowers or whatever it is, I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's always about drawing. Uh, so uh, uh, as all of, all of your work uh, is on the edge uh, and... Uh, you mean like this stuff? I know, I know them because I've seen them I do, uh, I on your more, media. <laughs> like that, Fabio. I, don't, I don't own sketchbooks. I've never had a sketchbook. Okay. When I went to your country, everybody took a sketchbook. I didn't it's take a sketchbook. <laughs> Somehow for me, it was just, I wanted to, you know, everybody, lots of people say this. I just wanted to be there. I didn't want to try to draw being there. Uh, so, I, and, and subsequently, I've never had, um, but I wanted to show you this as well. This is what I'm wearing. Right now. Yeah, so I wore those for you, Fabio. I wore those for you today. Um, but no, I, I, I mean, I draw for all kinds of reasons, but mostly like you, I think, and Peter, others who are here. There's so little time to work actually that I don't tend to um, wander or doodle or sh I don't do that any longer. I used to do things when we lived in Hollywood, I would take, <clears throat> I would make six or 800 marks until I liked one. I would just sit in a chair and, and then I would make a folded paper translation of that. And then I would try to translate that into a flower vase or a house or something like that. I don't do anything like that now. I was just curious because for one specific reason, because staying always on the edge of a research requires such, for me, it's my impression, it requires such an amount of energy. So that's why I, I was asking this. Uh, it's, uh, it's very basic the, the, the question. I realize this, but uh, yeah, but I don't. Yeah, I don't think of myself as being on any kind of edge, Fabio. I think what I do is is it's not. It may not look conventional, but I think I don't know if I think in conventional. I don't know what we mean by conventional. I, I don't think of the work as 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 cutting edge or edge or. <laughs> um, I think of it as it, it seems maybe it's just all feels normal to me now. Yeah. The ways in which I think about things and the things that I do, they, they, they seem fairly conventional. My work seems conventional to me. My work seems conventional to me. Whoa. Not some of those word ditties, not the conceptual catalyst, the little bits, and maybe some of the Photoshop, the recent Photoshop house garden landscape bits, but everything else seems really, really conventional to me. It is, it is, I'm asking this because basically it's not conventional for the others. Uh, and uh, in, in the meantime, it's so incredibly interesting. So that's why as I was asking uh, to you this, because I, I, uh, very, right. I, I discovered about uh, this series of uh, flowers paintings from Piet Mondrian very late. Yeah. And I was very curious about this, let's say, it was not a research. I had the, the impression that if he felt this need, just that, so. Uh. Yeah, no, I should do that. I remember, this isn't exactly what you're saying. I know Brian does things like this, but I remember when I met my friend, Neil Denari, and Neil must, he must have made, at that point, in the late 80s, like 10,000 sectional drawings in his sketchbooks. And I just, I don't, I don't know why I tend to target things or I, I don't tend to, I don't tend, but I'm going to look, I know a little bit the Mondrian flowers, but I'm going to look at those um, and try to relate those to your, your question and your thought about Mondrian's other discipline work and so on. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks you. A, thanks thank again. You. I mean, I, I'm full of, I can, I can show you, I'm full of notes here. So I, I, I don't want to take <laughs> off uh, time from the others. <laughs> We'll be in touch. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Fabian. Uh, we have put a few questions uh, on the chat. Uh, I'll try to do my best with the accent and not misspell anything. But um, so um, from Ken uh, Perry, does not knowing how to use a tool provide a certain sense of liberation and allow for greater exploration? How much does writing inform the creative process? And do you mind a happy accident or um, 
are you trying to avoid this kinds of collisions? Yes, to all three. Yeah. Sorry, that was, who was that? That was Ken? Yes, Ken um, yeah. Coenten's. Yeah, the first one, detectives would get interested in the broken instrument or not knowing how to use it. So yeah, of course, inventing things, that's probably where the real discovery comes. Normally we just pick things, like when I was in school, I would just pick a compass up and use it as everybody else used it. Uh, once you try to get it to walk across the surface and then you know, fly in the air, then it's, it, it opens things up. So yes, absolutely, go for the uh, unknowability. The second one had to do with, I know there was a happy accident thing, which I totally, that's to do with implicit knowledge and constructing latent understandings about things just based on how I work or how I think about things. And, and huh, well, that might be an idea that's worth cultivating. This, this, the second part of the question though, can I- write, how, how, how much writing. does writing? Yeah, so what I didn't show you really is in, 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 in almost all the work, the slow work and the medium work, there are yellow pads. There's a lot of writing in the yellow pads, not, not prose, but there are lots of sort of sometimes quotations, sometimes language folds, uh, elect electronically driven dioramas crossed with metaphorical blah, blah, blah. So I use language in that way a fair bit to allow me to capture, to intersect key ideas that I'm working with. Um, I like making captions for images because they also, they're, they're I, I, to be, can, the answer to the question is, I enjoy working with multiple levels and families of representation. Sometimes those get mixed, so language and imagery and diagrams and so on, those are just helpful to me because they begin to relationally sort of propagate. They begin to sort of talk with one another. And I, I begin to hear things which I had not intended to hear and things that might then get incorporated in the work. So yeah, I use writing in lots of different ways, uh, but mostly I use it to, to develop my imagination. I try to use language folds and metaphors in particular to try to keep my conceptual um, engine alive. <laughs> totally. Let me just go for the next one. There's uh, this, this, this one is very interesting. So from Andrew Hart says, uh, students often ask, where do I start drawing? On behalf of my students, how do you start? But also, how do you decide pencils down? <laughs> so Andrew, thank you. That's a very nice question. <laughs> Uh, so so it, 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 it varies. Um, like in the landscape drawings, I, I set the format up. 18 by 24, two layers of white trace, nine inch by 12 inch. Those all get started that way. They have tape, they have four uh, lines of tape on them. They all get taped the same way and they all get dated and named the same way. So those, those all start the same way. And then it's highly, highly, highly varied in terms of how other, other drawings start. Um, I, I don't do anything like sketch drawings out like the David's Island drawing or thematic drawing or something. I don't, I don't do anything like that. I have a base idea sometimes about the primary structure of a drawing, but mostly what I do is try to be clear with myself. This is what the drawing is about. This you're trying to work on four degrees of temporality, uh, conditions linked with silhouette and deep space and things linked to metaphorical data sets. That's the job of the drawing. And then I work from there. So, but it, it varies then in terms of how I actually, you know, whatever it is, make a digital mark or whether I'm, you know, drawing on something or cutting paper out. It, it varies enormously. Uh, so that, sorry, that's not a great, um, that's not a great answer, but I, I'll try to answer the second part when do I know when to finish basically? So it's two parts, uh, three parts. One, if the, if the drawing or image has done the work that I've set out for it to do, then, and it starts to plane laterally and I'm not learning anything from it, that's the first way in which I know to stop. Secondly, I make um, optical judgments and sort of whatever little intellect I have, I made intellectual and optical judgments about that's enough for the drawing. It can't take more or it needs less or whatever. So I make sort of compositional eye 
hand-eye coordination judgments. But thirdly, I also want to leave drawings in a place where they let me take the next shot. So they need to leave things in the air. They need to let, let a series of questions hover so that I can take the work and transform it somewhere else. So that it's essential for most of the drawings that they leave things indeterminate. They're, they're, they're things that I've committed to and understand and other things that are now inflections towards the next phase or phases of the work. But I also make judgments at all kinds of levels that are in addition to that, like relative to my work, what does this drawing want to say relative to other things that I've made? I'm not saying this for anybody else. I make those judgments relative to what I do when I do them. So does this drawing need to talk to other drawings? Does it need to open up discussions about architectural drawing or about, you know, relationships to history? So I, I, I make, again, 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. Even when I work on a simple drawing, I try to, I make decisions at, at lots of different levels about when something's that are finished. Well, I'm going to skip all the thank yous. I mean, you should read them after, just go straight to, <laughs> well, there's many, many thank yous. Uh, so I do apologize because um, I think um, the next one, of course. Um, this is for, from uh, Widery. Um, would you say your drawings are a representation of the process or is it a, a visual of the final product? Do you know from the beginning what the final drawing might look like, or are they the result of trial and alter and try again and experimentation of techniques that may or not be successful? Do you ever delete? <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very seldom do I delete. So I'll start there. I don't delete things from drawings. If I delete something from a drawing, um, it is a design activity. So if I, if I have lines, for example, that I don't want in a drawing, you'll find pieces of tape that then might be coded according to where the drawing instrument that helped make that line was when it made the line. So I don't tend to, I don't tend to get things like an erasing shield out, for example, and erase bunch big parts of drawings. Because I am interested in the degrees, I, I don't think I make process. I'm not, I'm not particularly interested in the process. That's not why I make drawings like I make them. I make drawings, but, and also I make, I think, different kinds of drawings. So the question is also a little bit hard to get around. Um, but I, yes, I make, I make mistakes. Uh, I don't mind, I don't mind mistakes. I don't mind hunches. I keep, I try to keep lots of things in play. Mostly I try to allow myself to author, let's say, or to create work using any range of capacities, little capacities that I have from my intuition to hunches, to someone, what someone else might've said, to things which I've rehearsed educationally. I, I don't, I don't make heavy judgments. Like I don't need to know everything and then do everything, do something else. Now I used to be that way. So I lot, lots of errant things, lots of things that don't make sense, even to me in some of the drawings. I don't try to make sense out of everything because that would, as the surrealist would tell us, would you try to make sense or logically rationalize things? You clip, you clip lots of things off that are possible. And I see, I see Peter Baldwin snick a little bit there because he's the guy I mean he's got things running around there that are you know they grow overnight and he, turned, he didn't even have to do work and they turn up and he's got all kinds of stuff that he didn't expect so um, yeah but I yeah I don't um, I don't know whether I answered the question thoroughly no I don't know what often it depends again what drawings no I all, almost I almost never know what drawings will look like when I start them Unless it's a render, you know, unless we're trying to make renderings or something, we're trying to accomplish certain effects and uh, communicate in certain kind of ways, then I have a sense of what they'll look like. But if you're talking about the manual drawings, like the, the ones that are made of layers, no, no, I don't, they're not seen as, to, to be perfectly honest with you, Wittery, they were never meant to be seen by anyone but me and maybe Amy and, and her daughter. They were never, ever, they're never, they're just worksheets, to be perfectly honest. They're worksheets. It's the way I work. 
I've been lucky, super, super, super lucky to have, you know, get work out in the world, you know, published or exhibitions or, you know, me putting silly stuff on Instagram. They're never meant to be seen by other people, really. Lucky us. So sure. it works. Just, it's, it's, <laughs> now, I don't mean that in, I don't mean that in, I'm selfish. Um, I, I mean that, that, that I work on the work according to what I need to do. I, and if people are interested in those, absolutely fantastic. I feel incredibly humbled, but I, I, I make the work as I need to make it. I don't, I don't, yeah, I'm not aspiring to, I, I, I say this to myself, if no one ever saw a piece of work that I made in my life, it probably wouldn't make me unhappy. I'm wow. happy to share. I, you know, I'm a teacher and I'm happy to be a part of the discourse. But when I make work, I, it's a cosmology, as, as, as B said. It's, it's a world construction for me, no matter how simple or complex the work is. So I can live, I live quite fully in the, in the, in the work. You must share. You know, the world will not forgive you if you don't. <laughs> I'm very humbled to do that, I have to say. Because I don't think, I honestly don't think, I, I, I don't think a lot of my work, to be honest. I, I don't think the work is very high quality work. We have um, a question from Clive. Um, in the digital work, do you notice the absence of your bodies making efforts in the outcomes when compared to the desk made work? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, while, while I said earlier, Clive, thank you for the question. It's good to see Clive out in Portland or somewhere near Portland. Um, and you ought to follow Clive's work as well. Um, when I make decisions, even my little Photoshop stuff, my mindset is operational. <laughs> like, which keys do I need to hit and which selection do I need to make on the menu? When I make drawings, it's nothing like that. I reach for the Copenhagen ships curve because I know that it's somewhere. <laughs> and I bring, but I'm thinking about, you know, the notational and indexical things that I'm trying to work on right then. It's a totally different mindset to work in the machine. I don't enjoy I don't enjoy it at all. While I would like those skills, I don't like to work in the machine at all. In terms of bodily effort, you know, for me to work on the drawings, it's a workout. It's a discipline. You know, I set the table up. I get I get my mental set correct. You know, I get the tools washed and all that. There's just a whole discipline to that. And the machine, you just hit the on button if the operating system is going. And uh, yeah, it's totally, totally different. It's a mindset thing for me more than a bodily thing, Clive. Just a totally different, just working cognitively. I'm working according to the operations. The machine's telling me what to do. It's offering me options. The drawing table doesn't tell me what to do. So, so can I follow up and- uh, Yes, please. Just yeah. ask how one kind of places value in what is lost uh, 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 or understands a kind of loss of value perhaps in the digital realm over the bodily realm or is there or is there no loss of value it's just no, I, no, I don't think it's a for me it's not a loss at all and I don't want to I will never in my life say that I prefer or manual and analog working in relationship to digital working not at all they just do different things well and they don't do things well so I'd like to be discretionary about when we use them, different phases of the work. I call tailored visualizations. I, 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 I don't think there are losses, Clive. I'm totally interested. The, last, near, the next to the last body of work where we're looking at imaging and modeling, I'm totally interested in how the machine operates. And I don't, I don't, I don't think of it as a loss at all. It's just a, it's a, it's a, cogn it's just a different cognitive set. It's a different level of different level of embodiment. It's still embodiment. You know more than I do about levels of embodiment. Uh, but it, no, I don't think of it as a loss. No, not at all. Because I'm learning things, you know, just operating according to the protocols of Photoshop. I'm beginning to understand much more about diagrammatic logics, about combinatory things, about how things have more immediate appearance in the in the Photoshop realm and what other things need to be, they have a backstory going on in the machine. So that, that also interests me. It's just another form of embodiment really. But it's good to see you, Clive. <laughs> good to see you. 
You're in the attic. Yeah. My studio. I wish that was a basement. I wish you'd said that the profile of that roof was your basement, Clive. That would be truly you. That would make living upstairs uncomfortable. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Peter has his hand up. Um, hi, Peter. Is that the pesky Baldacchino then? Hi, hi, hi. Um, hi, Peter. Hi, Perry. Uh, thank you uh, for a wonderful uh, lecture, as, as always. Um, I, I suppose I, I, I had a, a, a question, some thoughts. I wondered if you could open up a little bit about the, perhaps the rhythm between working at different speeds and through different media. Uh, and, and whether you see that uh, the, the change of pace perhaps reopens or expands an opportunity for critical distance and reflection, uh, perhaps in the same way that reappropriation of earlier work uh, might or, or might not um, within, within your process. Yeah, that's a good question, Peter. I should have drawn out a little bit why, why, this, why, the, why the work is organized according to three speeds. When I, when I was in school, I was a slow worker. I worked a lot of hours at Columbia, but I worked slowly on my work. And it was true in the profession when I worked with Denise and Bob, I was very, very disciplined and laborious in the, in the, in the techniques I used, the speeds at which I worked. Um, the David's Island work, really was it began to turn up where I, I, I researched islands for three weeks before I turned up at the drawing table and that was fine I learned a lot about Matisse and nautical cartography and blah 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 blah, blah. but it occurred to me and that drawing took about 125 hours did the strategic plot which was great. I totally enjoyed it. I wouldn't give up a split second of making that drawing but after I made a handful of those drawings I realized that even if I had full work weeks, it would take me forever to produce work, A, but B, to work on work and rework on it and rework on it and transform it, that would really take me a long time. So it occurred to me then that maybe I, this is when this fast twitch house kicked in, that maybe if I thought differently, the drawing still took a while, but I ideated and began to imagine that house very quickly through analogic thinking. So it allowed me to accelerate, at least intellectually, at least mentally or intellectually, it allowed me to get a sense of what the work was gonna be almost immediately while I was still populating yellow pads and making variations on things. So it, it, that, at that point it occurred to me, the fast twitch was called that because in cycling I have really good slow twitch muscles, but I, in racing, I'm not, I wasn't a good fast, I don't have good fast twitch muscles. So it was related to cycling, but it was also related to that project was just trying to get me to work faster. I think what I've understood subsequently is that to know when to work at different speeds has become really, really important to me. It's a little bit for me knowing that there are different diagrams in which speeds of working, for example, to isolate that, there are different ways in which that algorithm can play itself out in the body of work. So I'm interested in trying to tailor or tune the speeds of working relative to the phase of the work that I'm working on right now. So it does become a kind of critical method for me as much as being able to produce work quickly or in a medium speed or in a faster, slower speed. Um, you, um, so I've gotten, in, and I don't think I understood this in school and I don't think I teach about this. Most of the work that the students do generally in thesis, for example, it's a slow boil super interesting work, but we're not looking at things out the gate like a week into it and saying, okay, we're working on the proposal here. So I, just increasingly as a way to thicken or bulk out, not thicken, to bring pieces of my practice into play that are not there, the speeds of working becomes incredibly important to me. Like the Photoshop house garden landscape things in total, in total, those are probably only double the time of the David's Island drawing. 150 of those in a David's Island drawing. But the kind of the, the knowledge, the knowledge that I get from both of them is, is for me helpful. It's a very, very different form of knowledge construction. But 100 drawings 
at an hour and a half a piece, that's a lot different than doing one drawing at 125 hours or something. So they just, they have different modalities, they have different delivery rates, they have different levels of access. And I'm just interested in my interest in agility and plasticity and being able to do different kinds of work in different situations. I just need, that's, that's, that's like a basic, that's like having shoestrings in your shoes if you're gonna run a race to me. It's a very, very, the speeds of working is, a, is, is not something I understood until very recently as a discipline. I believe it's very, very basic to understand the ramifications of working at different speeds. And importantly, for me to become more like an acupuncturist and work out when that speed's gonna deliver those insights in relationship to that transformation or that growth in the work. So it's a super nice question. I think there was a second part to it, though, Peter. That I, I suppose, really, just the, 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 the sort of subset of it for me was also um, a, a little bit of a thought about: um, Do you find that uh, the act of reappropriation within, or, or self-appropriation, perhaps rather than reappropriation? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I remember that as soon as you mentioned that again. Um, I don't know about relative to my own work exactly, but when it, appropriation, you've seen this, I think before, appropriation is one of the 14 design methods that I've identified. And I think when we appropriate things, we get a lot of connotative juice. We get a lot of suggestive stuff when we appropriate things that are already up and running. So for example, when I ask the students to use downloadable digital models to build an environment, they, they're not dealing with a circle that they extrude in Rhino as a point of beginning, but they're dealing with things that are already imbued that have referential associative range. So the same thing is true, like when I'll fold a drawing of mine back into another drawing, I'm avoiding the white paper syndrome, which is really difficult for me. Now, I just make things on drawings to get going because of the white paper syndrome. But the appropriation stuff, it's, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm, um, what's, uh, I don't think I'm like incestuous or I'm not, I'm not, I'm not egotistical in the sense that I need to use my own work. It has nothing to do with that. Um, but I think it gives me, it just gives me ground. I'm already going, I'm going. And now I can react to it, undo it, augment it. I'm already, I've been pushed into the water. I cannot wait any longer with when I appropriate things. Thank you, Perry. That's, uh, yeah, because I can, I can circle, I can hover around work for quite a long time. But when I commit to something through, through sometimes appropriation, as you rightly observe, Peter, I mean, a lot of the Photoshop work, that's just appropriating my work and winding it back on itself combined with a you know, bit of a time-lapse photograph. But it's also a good, it, sorry, to be quick, be a little bit quicker. It's also a good moment of critical reflection for me. Like the David's Island piece of work has turned up in about three or four different places by now. And it allows me to see that work from totally different perspectives because I appropriate bits of it to make a vertical surface proposition. Now, what's the status of that? What's the status of the drawing that I made 25 years ago relative to a thing that I made a year and a half ago? I'm using the same thing. So I, I'm interested in those kinds of conundrums, those pickles, those relational diagrams. I'm interested in the quiet hours I try to populate those kinds of diagrams and work out a position relative to them. Thanks, Perry. That's yeah, a, you're welcome, Peter. Thank well, you for the question. Well, Thanks for coming as well. Yeah. Well, you know, thank you for, for a, a wonderful and enlightening... Uh, well, don't know about the wonderful, but the student work was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Marvelous. Um, we do have a, a, some hands up from um, Mohamed um, Modi. Hi, Mohamed. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for letting me ask the question. Uh, thank you, Perry, for your really interesting lecture and sharing with us your inspiring and wonderful drawings. Actually, uh, with their ambiguity, they invite us to participate in the act of uh, interpretation and it brings a lot of meanings to those works uh, but actually the question that I have is that uh, these days or uh, actually in recent years some theorists talk about the term 
death of the, the drawing and they put it uh, against, uh, for example, simulation as an alternative. Uh, but uh, the point is that when they usually talk about drawing, uh, they mean analog drawing and uh, specifically hand drawings. Uh, and it's really interesting because with the resonance of this term in different uh, publications and after many years, we may conclude that drawing is a phoenix which can die <laughs> many times and again. Uh, I'm going to uh, use that you know, one. Yes, I'm going to yeah. use that. Thank you. It is a phoenix. They are phoenixes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. Uh, the question that I have is that uh, what is your personal definition of the drawing? And do you, uh, for example, account uh, photo montage or 3D modeling or image making as a drawing in a general sense? Or uh, I mean, that way we can say that drawing is not dead <laughs> and actually is alive. <laughs> Thank you. You're asking a good, there's a two part answer, I think, to your question. So I tend to not use the word drawing very often these days. I use imaging, visualization, representation, because drawing normally, it's the naming, naming problem. It normally gets packaged, hand sketches in Rome, having you know, a glass of wine with Fabio there, or in Trafalgar Square with all of you there in London and hand sketching or making things like plan sections and elevations on mylar or trace or canzone or whatever. Um, so I don't, visualizations for me is a more, like I don't use the word, I don't use building and architecture very often. I use spatiality. It's just my, this is my problem. But visualizations are just more accommodating to me in terms of the range of things that can that don't get mapped onto that word in relationship to something like drawing. Like I make drawings, but I don't, I mean, I'm drawing, but I'm also using all kinds of, I'm using imagery and I'm using downloaded digital model and parts and so on. So visualizations is just more generally useful for me. Um, how do I define, whoa. Um, I never, I, I make lists of things. I don't try to give them clear definitions. I try to work like Wallace Stevens does in the Blackbird. I try to work around what drawing might be, what it might constitute. So I don't know that I've ever, I don't know that I've ever really set out to describe drawing or drawings to myself. Um, I, I need to think about that. You know, I made 15 bullet points or 13 bullet points about drawings as a form of as right. a discipline, as a form to describe, but also discover as a form of visual thinking. So I just try to build around drawing or visualizations, yeah. but I don't know that I, I, I will do that. I will try to, I should do that given my, well, I don't, I'm not really interested in drawings. To be honest. <laughs> I'm just interested Actually, in what they allow me to do. I'm interested in drawings, of course. I have to be because that's all I that's all I do. But I'm interested in what they allow me, the worlds they allow me to build, what they allow me to, in a kind of metaphorical loom, what kinds of relations they allow me to um, be curious about, really. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a good. Uh answer for this question uh, because actually uh, I, I was wondering uh, if they talk about death of drawing uh, the word design which uh, which which has some roots in disegno in italian word which sure. means drawing for sure uh, how yeah. how do they talk about death of the drawing while the design is alive so that that that's really good and thank you for your answer it really helps i think but also but also drawing if you if this i've talked about this before but if you if you simply think about the development of one point perspective or linear perspective Virtual reality is, is in my world, is simply an extension of that. So no matter what people say about the death of drawing, drawing is etymologically, historically, relationally linked to no matter what the most advanced data, machine learned data, algorithmic visualizations, it's, it's linked, it's linked to drawing. So it's not, I don't think you can, it might be dead, but you're, you, it, you cut part of your own body off, I guess, but um, yeah, I don't, it, it, it depends. It depends how you use drawings. It, for me, it always, it always depends what you do with them. 
So I, I'm not, Groin is dead, maybe, but there are probably 15 people in the room here right now, names I can see who would, would, would beg to argue with that. Um, and they're having some contribution, not me. They're making serious contributions to the discipline and educational realms. Thank you very much. Yes, it is paradoxical, PB. I think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a tricky one. Um, it yes, it is. I'll <laughs> um, we have a note from, from Yaya. Um, I'm sorry, I need my specs on this. Um, in your drawings, there are some subtle jumps, different layers and character crossings that reminds me of the cosmogenics and the notion of jumping in the universe. Referring to Charles Jenks' book, is there a relationship between your drawings and cosmogenic, uh, cosmogenic uh, architecture? I mean, I could only say Thank you for the question, uh, Yaya, I guess is the way you pronounce your name half properly. Um, the, the root structure, maybe cosmos is linked because I think of them as world building, but I don't think of it as cosmological or cosmic cos architecture. Uh, no, but cosmos uh, in terms of world construction or um, an ecology of relationships according to a kind of cosmological orientation, possibly, but not architecture. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure is that the question. Cosmogenic architecture. Mm, cosmogenic, maybe, <laughs> it, it, it linked to my interest in speciation and um, cryptic indexes and things that belong to the genetic makeup of things. Yeah, genetic, genetic speciation, genetics, coding, not, not in coding terms, in terms of digital uh, operations, but maybe, yeah, cosmogenetic, maybe, yeah. Architecture, I don't know about the architecture part. <laughs> um, the jumping universe. Yeah, there's some, yeah, maybe. I mean, I know the Jenks writing, I haven't read that for a long time, but um, I mean, I'm probably more, they're more subtle, they're more subtle jumps, they're nudges and little, you know, sneaking through a threshold in my work. I don't know about, I don't know about the jumps. Um, I'm probably too cautious as a thinker and maker to have jumps. Um, ooh, there's a, uh, some back and forth between Peter and Mohammed about, so, so Peter says, is the death of drawing perhaps paradoxical? And Mohammed says, um, the drawing or drawing? Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> drawing out, drawing out, drawing in. <laughs> drawing, yeah. Blank drawing, adjectival drawing. Well, I don't know about the paradoxical question. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm going to, um, you mean that maybe in a more straightforward way than I'm trying to catch the nature of your question, but knowing you, I'm guessing it is, it is not a straightforward question or observation. <laughs> Clive says it's all about drawing out, understanding. That's, That's part fine. of it, Clive, I believe, but also I, I, I believe that that the drawings have uh, lots of work they do, rhetorical, discursive, drawing out, discovering, describing. I think it's important to understand that drawings, visualizations have many, many, many capacities and to begin to understand the backstory of those capacities is part of it. Yeah, maybe drawing out. I use that, I use drawings for that a lot, much more now than I used to. I, I, I'll start a piece of work with, you know, I know 25% about the work and I'm willing to get involved in the drawing or the drawing out of the thing to try to discover what the work's about. So yeah, I do think it, that's, sometimes it's that, yeah. I think that's super important, the point that you're making and the drawing out. I don't think we tend to think about drawings that way. We don't think about digital modeling, for example. I don't think we think about it that way at all. Sure. But the drawing out, for me, that's, that's the investment, that's the invitation, that's the generous ability to participate, to discover things, to find, 
to find them out, to find the metaphorical crimes out that you might not be aware of when you sit down to get to work. Wonderful chat here. Um, do we have any more yeah. questions? Anyone? Might be. Um, the great part of this is everybody's so much smarter than I am that I just learned. I just put through, put some little crumbs out there that I, you know, half think about and good student work, and then they give me these great questions and insights and so on. Nonsense! We're all here for you <laughs> to hear you. Um, P, um, Fabio says uh, you spoke about fats, uh, fats <laughs> drawing, I love uh, fats and drawing. fats drawing and suspended judgment. Does it has to do with uh, the John Cage att um, attempt to avoid the tyranny of the ego fast? Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, it, it may, Fabio, but it, yes, I know that. I know that the tyranny of uh, cages and Cage is a real important person for me. Um, for me, it has to do with countering my natural instinct to need to understand things before I work. It's as simple as that. So I've done all kinds of things in recent years to try to dismantle. I'm not a surrealist in that regard, although the surrealist and the broke period, which I meant to touch on, are probably the two most important cultural uh, development periods in, in, in Western culture for me. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know about the ego. It's just my natural tendencies are to want to know and to want to understand before getting involved. And I realized that you know, when I moved to LA, that I began to understand that probably 95% of the work that artists produce in the work in the world historically would never be produced if they were always thinking about rationalizing, logically trying to position, frame uh, a discipline for the work. And I said, this is just you're not you're just not letting your the full levels of creativity is a dangerous word for me, but I'm just not letting it all fuller levels of my, my whatever little capacities I have breathe. So I don't, I don't think of the the ego is. I'm mean, gonna think about that, but I don't I don't frame it that way for myself. Because again, to Clive's, you know, when I was talking about uh, trying to answer Clive's question, to discover things, to draw things out, is more interesting to me now 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 than to know things or to describe or to prove things. I'm just more interested. It's just the way I learn. I'm just interested in a half a hunch and then trying to discover, well, that might link to that and I need to research that and then the drawings need to be that. That just more interesting to me as a way to encounter the world. And I respect all kinds of ways to, you know, people can set up rules, you know, Peter Beisenman setting, you know, setting up rules and autonomy and so on. And, you know, steadfastly going after the, there are lots of ways that I respect to do work. I'm just more interested in discovering what the work can be about rather than trying to prove it through working on it, through working on it. Because the very, very, very few hours that I work, it's just pleasurable to me. And again, it's a discovering and constructing small mini worlds for myself that I like the puzzles, the conundrums, the possible consequences of something whispering to something else that I don't intend. I love all of the, the latent nascent tacit constructions that go on when I when I work properly, which I haven't done in years. Since 2012 is probably the last time I worked properly with Nat. We have one more question from um, Nuran Sami. Um, do apologize, I butcher every single name, so I do apologize. Uh, when did you decide to share and why? Oh, that's a good question, Iran. Um, so there was a small gallery um, called the Fluxus Gallery at the time in San Diego that somehow saw a few of my landscape drawings. This is the very early 90s and they, they wondered if they could show some of them and I said, absolutely. But I'd been around plenty of publishing for sure, sharing, you know, working with Eisenman and Stern and Denise Scott Brown and Bob Ventura, you know, works all over the place. So, but I never had, um, that was the start. And then 
Oh, I don't remember the second, just exhibition, an exhibition offering was the, was the way I started to share things. And then some years ago, a, a friend from Syrac, Ann Troutman, sent me an email and she said, I know you're, you're in Michigan now and you know, I'd be interested in the work that you're doing. Why don't you make a Facebook page? And I'm like, I'm not a social media guy at all, at all. I'm a monk actually. And um, so I, I started to post a few things there. And then uh, our daughter said, two colleagues at Michigan said, you ought to get an Instagram account, you know, a couple of years ago or three years ago or whatever. And, and I shouldn't put anything on Facebook or Instagram or any of that. So anyway, one thing led to another. And I've been fortunate to have you know, a fair number of exhibitions. And I'm happy to share things. And I like Mohammed's thought that, Basically, people, you can find your way into them. They're, they're, it's not as if I th that's one of the reasons I like to make the drawings the way that I do and the content that they have is I think there are different ways in for different kinds of people. Like my mom can surf some of the waves in the drawings. You know, she recognizes grids and figures and, you know, other things. And other, they're just different ways into them. So, you know, I'm happy. I'm, I've been humbled i've been truly 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 humbled for people to be interested in my work and i don't say that like modestly or i, I don't i don't say it that way i've been incredibly humbled i feel um totally unworthy and very 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 grateful that anyone frankly is interested in what i do it's incredibly moving to me I mean, I make the work because I need to make the work, but that other people might be interested in it, someone might be interested in it, may it make some small contribution, that's phenomenally gratifying to me. So anyway, thanks to all of you well, for turning up. That's gratifying to me as well. <laughs> you know, I think I can speak for, for for everyone present uh, and not present, how inspiring you are. It's not just the, the visuals, the imagery, it's the words, the connection, uh, the sort of lyrical poetry that you make uh, bridging uh, uh, the visual and the spoken word that is, is mesmerizing, is riveting. It, it's, uh, it's just so inspiring. Um, Thank you very well, we much. We should be thanking you. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so, again, I'm, I'm super humbling. I don't mean this, again, I don't mean this immodestly. It's very, very humbling to me that, that people find something in the work that's, that's helpful to them in terms of their lives or contribution to you know, something they might be doing. That's, that's a, it's humbling. I don't, I don't have a better word for it. So thank you, thank you very much again, uh, B and everyone who's still on the call and B for your friendship and lots of people out there for their friendships. I can't acknowledge, you know, everybody now, but um, if we're turning up, it's great to see everybody. <laughs> and I look forward to maybe physically, you know, share a meal, <laughs> who knows, maybe we share meals at some point and, <laughs> and, and in a proximity of one another, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so thank you uh, again. Uh, very, very honored to be a part of the Archism series. And, I, I'm uh, the one thanking you, Perry, uh, well, for, for, you for such kindness, such kindness um, uh, and welcome. attention. You're very, very welcome. And thank you, everyone, for, for, for zooming in. Um, you know, I think this was uh, the perfect way to, to end this series. Uh, with our master Perry uh, sharing his work and, and, and knowledge um, and I'll thank you all for, for, for zooming in um, every week so um, hopefully there'll be more um, in, in the spring um, so um, I can only thank everyone that made it possible you know I'm just here pressing buttons that's it and you know it's all the arc is 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 you all um so i, I can't thank you enough um, um to perry thank you so much um yes, just quickly thank everyone who's on the call but i also want to thank the students and the colleagues and the institutions that i've been a part of 
I mean, without the students, the, the work that we showed, again, it's much more interesting than mine. I'm incredibly honored to be able to share time with them. So I just want to, I, I can see that former students and now their friends and so on are on the call. Just thanks to all the students that I've had the good fortune to be able to hang around with and learn from over all the years. You're so lucky. <laughs> I don't know about that. You have to ask them. That's They're very lucky. Right. Leave the college. <laughs> they wouldn't be here if they weren't. Yeah, very um, good. And, and on the same, my, my students have a final review tomorrow and they are here. Uh, and um, um, I, I want to thank them uh, just as on a side because I know they'll be stressing out to get everything ready for tomorrow. Uh, but sure. they, they wouldn't miss you. They wouldn't yeah, miss that, this opportunity. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, good skill. Did we. <laughs> yeah, good skill. Enjoy the pleasure of working. I wish I had that pleasure once in a while, but yeah, good skill tomorrow. And thank you for turning up as well. It was great to be at the school a couple of years ago. Maybe uh. you'll. <laughs> Thanks so much. You're very welcome. Thank you all. And everyone, keep so safe. Yeah, be safe and well, people. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.